So in this segment, I'll be discussing the public international law aspects of the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. That is, how the law that governs interstate conduct is implicated by the pandemic. Now, the relevance of international law may not be immediately obvious, but the reality is that global pandemics are quintessentially an international problem. Indeed, the very definition of pandemic emphasizes the global international nature of an epidemic. A virus respects no borders, it can spread around the world, it poses a threat to all of humanity, and thus a global response is required to address the crisis. And the legal regime that governs interstate action and behavior is therefore directly and significantly implicated. There are, of course, many aspects of public international law that are implicated in all sorts of different ways, but in this short segment, I'm going to just touch on a couple of them. So to begin with, I'm going to look at the obligations of, that states have to other states in how they respond to a pandemic. And this includes both the obligations to prevent the spread of the disease and the constraints imposed on states in how far they can go in responding to the, into, to the pandemic. Secondly, I'll look at the obligations of states to people within their territory. Uh, and this, again, includes both affirmative obligations to people within the country to protect them from, from the disease or from the pandemic, as well as constraints on, on states not to violate the rights of people within the country in their efforts to respond to the epidemic. So to begin with the obligations of states to prevent the spread of disease, the starting point is the so-called no harm principle and principles of due diligence. Now, all states have obligations under international law to prevent activity or conduct within their territory from causing harm to other states. This is commonly associated with environmental law to transboundary harm from pollution, but it also applies in the context of response to epidemics and creates due diligence obligations to make best efforts to identify the risks or threats of an epidemic and to prevent the spread of infectious diseases to other states. And this applies to all states, not only the state in which the infection originated, but all states have an obligation to take steps to make best efforts in line with their capabilities to prevent the spread of infectious diseases beyond their borders. Now, these general obligations have been refined and codified to some extent in a treaty, the International Health Regulation, or the IHR, which is overseen by the World Health Organization, or WHO. Now, the WHO is an international organization that was formed in 1948 by a treaty that now has 194 state parties, including the United States. The purpose of the WHO is to serve as the directing and coordinating authority on all international health work. And it was given the authority under its founding treaty to promulgate regulations specifically designed to prevent the international spread of disease. And so the WHO did so in 1969 in the form of the International Health Regulations, or IHR, which comprise a separate treaty overseen by the WHO. Now, the IHR was significantly amended in 2005, after the SARS break, in order to expand the scope of pandemics that, it would come, that would come within the scope of or under the purview of the IHR. And there are now 196 states that are a party to the IHR, again, including the United States. And the purpose of the IHR is to quote, prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease in ways that are commensurate with and are limited to public health risks and which avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. And so the IHR imposes a number of specific due diligence obligations on states, including the creating and maintaining of the capacity to deal with an epidemic and obligations to immediately inform the WHO and the international community more broadly after the emergence or spread of infectious diseases that pose an international threat. Also, significantly, it imposes an obligation to base health measures responding to an infection on scientific principles and to collaborate with other states and to cooperate with the WHO to the extent possible. Now, under the IHR, the Director General of the WHO can also determine that a spreading infection constitutes a public health emergency of international concern, or a PHEIC, and states are required to take appropriate measures in accordance with advice and recommendations of the WHO in their response to the disease. So as noted, the IHR and the WHO try to strike a balance between 
on the one hand, actions to help protect populations from the spread of disease and to treat those who are infected, and on the other hand, limit the disruption to international trade, to free flow of peoples and other aspects of the global economy. Which brings us to the second aspect of obligations of states to other states. And this is that aside from the obligations of the IHR itself, international law constraints constrains to some extent how states may respond to a pandemic. States may want to take defensive measures that may violate other international law obligations in, in agreements on international trade, free travel, refugee law, finance and investment agreements, and so forth. Consider the closing of borders and travel bans that have been imposed by many countries in the current pandemic. These may violate other obligations. Now, some of those violations can be justified under exemptions and derogation clauses in the, in the relevant treaties, which can be invoked in the case of emergency or crisis, but others may not. All of this requires complex issues that, that have to be analyzed in their specifics. But let's turn then to the, the second set of obligations. These are the obligations of states to the people within their territory. And again, here there is an obligation to prevent harm, and there are constraints on the measures that states can take in response to the pandemics. So to begin with the affirmative obligations, the starting point are really two treaties that form the bedrock of human rights, human rights law. These are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or the ICESCR. These comprise the core of what is commonly referred to as the International Bill of Rights. <clears throat> these provide a, <clears throat> for a right to life and a right to health and well-being. And together, these rights require states to take affirmative action to protect the people within their territory from the threat posed by a pandemic. The ICESCR quite specifically requires states to take steps for the prevention and treatment and control of epidemics, while the ICCPR provides for the right to life of all human beings. And this right creates an obligation on states to protect people from threats to the lives of individuals, even threats from natural causes such as pandemics. Moreover, the right to life is, is of course a non-derogable right, meaning that the state cannot suspend or derogate from its obligations in times of emergency or crisis. Now, this is relevant, of course, to the recent suggestions that government responses to the pandemic have been overreactions, that we should be willing to allow some number of deaths in our society in order to safeguard the economy. And aside from the profound moral, ethical, and other ob objections to such arguments, government inaction in, in the face of a clear and present danger of, of a pandemic would be a clear violation of international law obligations, the violation of the people's rights to life and health and well-being. But international human rights law also places constraints on how states can respond to the pandemic. In trying to respond to a pandemic, states may want to isolate people, place them in quarantine, limit travel within the state, use electronic surveillance, such as cell phone data, as has been used in, in Singapore and Israel to track and monitor those who have been infected, to use force to enforce social distancing regulations. We've heard of excesses in countries like Kenya uh, in just the last few days. All of these can trigger human rights issues, potentially violate the right to liberty, security of the person, association and assembly, freedom of movement, the right to privacy. Now, some of these may be derogations from the rights or obligations justified by the crisis but they may also be violations of non-derogable rights. And they, again, this requires careful analysis. So in conclusion, all of this is, has been really just a very brief, very high level look at some of the international law considerations and implications of the pandemic. There are of course many nuances to all of this. There are debates over the scope, over compliance issues, over the extent to which any of this can be enforced. And we could spend a lot of time talking about how all of this applies to the current facts in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's already been a lot of finger pointing over responsibility for the spread of the virus, but none of that's really particularly helpful right now. Pandemics are by their very nature global problems which require international coordination and cooperation to combat and to overcome. One of the tragedies of this pandemic is that so far, no country is really taking the lead and there has therefore been an absence of cooperation and coordination among the major powers. Now, 
I'll leave you with, uh, for those interested in further reading on this, I would really suggest these four blogs on international, uh, international law and national security law, which have been covering the COVID-19 pandemic carefully, uh, and as well, the WHO website. So with that, uh, thank you and stay safe.